that we deal with with complex traits. We also have to deal with the environmental factors of the clinic itself, such as the acute treatment that we give to patients, and uh, any pathogenic factors, such as if it's a viral or a bacterial infection. And all of these coalesce to create the complex host immune response that we see in sepsis. So uh, patients, it's not surprising then that patients present with a lot of clinical heterogeneity. So um, it's very important for us to develop disease biomarkers, as well as uh, identify specific therapeutic targets for um, uh, intervention. There are currently no targeted uh, treatments for sepsis. We do know that sepsis is genetic. So there are studies that have shown that infection or susceptibility to infection specifically is heritable. This has been done with adopted children. Um, and we also know that infection in general, susceptibility to infection is comorbid with traits that are heritable. So there's good reason to study the genetics of sepsis. And so these types of genetic questions are being answered in the genomic advances in sepsis study or the GAINS study. This is where most of my data comes from and this is what my lab works with. So this cohort consists of adult patients that were admitted to the ICU uh, with either community acquired pneumonia or fecal peritonitis. These are the two most common causes of sepsis in the United Kingdom. And we have taken blood at time points uh, one, three, and five. So days one, day three, and day five post admission to the ICU. Um, from these blood samples, we've collected a lot of data, but the three data types that I'll talk about today are from these molecular assays, specifically from uh, genotyping from microarrays. We have mRNA from whole blood leukocytes. So that's all the cells over there, uh, other than platelets and erythrocytes. So it is very hetero, uh, it's a very heterogeneous tissue. And then finally, we also have protein from whole blood plasma. So to, today I'll present a bit on characterizing mechanisms underlying these uh, the effects of molecular QTL that we have from this GAINS cohort. So I'll start by talking a bit about what we've done to map molecular QTL, followed by our, our efforts to understand which cell types are dysregulated in this disorder. Uh, I'll talk a bit about co-expression modules that we've been developing to identify transregulators of disease-relevant molecular programs, and finally uh, talk a bit about co-localization that I've been doing between molecular QTL. So the GAINS cohort has a lot of participants. Um, of which around half, a thousand, uh, more or less, have been genotyped. And we also have uh, prote uh, proteins from mass spectrometry and uh, mRNA abundance from RNA-seq data. And so we have uh, characterized EQTL and PQTL in these cohorts. And so you can think of the PQTL coming from this set of patients and the EQTL from here. I've mentioned on the side that we have more samples than we do patients because we have serial samples. As I mentioned, we have up to uh, three samples per patient based on how many we were able to retrieve. And so I'll start by talking a bit about the transcriptomics and proteomics and what's been done with the EQTL and PQTL respectively. This is work that's been led by Katie Burnham at the Wellcome Sanger Institute and Yushin Mi at the Wellcome Center for Human Genetics at Oxford. Um, starting with the EQTL, we took uh, the 20,000 expressed genes that we detected and tested for cis EQTL in a one megabase window around the transcription start site. We identified around half, uh, half of the genes have an EQTL, so they're e-genes, and of those around 40% have more than one um, EQTL based on a forward regression approach. For the PQTL, we took more of a trans uh, or more of a genome-wide approach, so we tested every SNP uh, genome-wide. And for the 269 proteins that we had, we then categorized any identified PQTL into either cis or trans based on their position in the genome. So we identified 29 proteins that had PQTL. And as it turned out, each protein had only one PQTL. So 23 were in cis and six were in trans. I should mention, uh, since this is a statistical conference, that we used a linear mix model. And so one of the things we have to deal with is the serial samples. And so we use patients um, as a random effect to control for uh, patient effects. So I'll start by talking a bit about uh, working with cell types. So I've been retrieving publicly available ataxic data to better understand uh, which cell types might be dysregulated in this disorder. And so I started by identifying this immune atlas uh, from Horses et al. 2017 and Caldron et al. 2019, which consists of hematopoietic and primary immune cell types that are relevant to sepsis. We are particularly interested in the stimulated cell types because we believe that the stimulation will recapitulate some of the biology we see in the septic condition. So to be uh, very brief, what I did was use a method called GoShifter to test for enrichment of cis-EQTL in these primary immune cell types. Um, 
So I started by identifying differentially accessible peaks. Uh, these are regions of the genome that are uh, easier to access under a stimulated state. And we tested for enrichment of SysEQTL based on this permutation-based test uh, that is implemented in GoShifter. And as you can see, we did not particularly identify any specific enrichment in any specific cell type. There's a nominal association with central memory CD8 positive T cells, but uh, nothing passes FDR. And we were not particularly surprised because uh, we do happen to know that neutrophils are the most important cell type in sepsis, and they were not represented in this atlas, unfortunately. And so we uh, went ahead and looked for another atlas and found Ram Mohan et al. 2021, which uh, recently performed ex vivo stimulation of neutrophils. So neutrophils retrieved from blood, stimulated with six different ligands that were sepsis relevant. Right, so here we used another method called CHEERS, and CHEERS we believe is more appropriate for this type of data. CHEERS was specifically built to deal with one cell type that has been stimulated with different ligands. And in addition to taking uh, the peak data, it also integrates peak count data. So it's more of a quantitative way of testing for enrichment. So we looked for enrichment of SysEQTL in these uh, different stimulation states. So the ligands that were used are here on the left, and the immune receptors that they target are to the left of that. And so we saw enrichment of Sisiki tail in three of the six stimulated states, specifically for FLAG, R848, and HMGB1. So these are sepsis relevant, as I mentioned previously. They these are uh, targeting toll-like receptors that are detecting gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria, single-stranded RNA from viruses, um, and also damage-associated molecular pattern signals. Right. So that was our work. That's my work surrounding cell type regulation in sepsis. From here, I'll talk a bit more about co-expression modules. So co-expression modules are, you can think of them as lists of genes, and those gene lists tend to be co-expressed or tend to have correlation. And so there's a pretty common algorithm called weighted gene co-expression network analysis that identifies these modules, which is exactly what I implemented, and identified 106 gene modules based on the 20,000 expressed genes that we had. So on the left here, I'm showing the enrichment of these modules, uh, some of these modules with Excel signatures that we have uh, derived from, not us, but uh, the Excel package has derived from whole blood um, transcriptomics. And so you can see that some of these modules tend to have some pretty cell type specific effects. Like if you look at this module, it's capturing the CD4 positive T cell signature, but then this module right here is capturing more of, the, or sorry, this is the uh, T cell signature, and then there's a CD4 positive T cell signature over here just as an example. The modules are numbered from largest to smallest, so you'll notice that many of these modules are pretty large. With co-expression modules, uh, the module eigengene is a very convenient method of representing the variation in the module. So the eigengene is the first principal component of the genes that are in the module, and so it represents the principal axis of variation in that module. And we saw some pretty strong associations of these um, eigengenes with clinical endophenotypes of interest to us. So we tested for association with outcome, so 28-day survival in the case of sepsis, with cell proportion, um, SRSQ, which is a factor associated with survival in sepsis, and time point. So we compared day five eigengene values versus day one to see if we uh, saw any association. So the last thing that we did was uh, we took our, all our module eigengenes and we performed single variant association mapping across the genome using, a t using the same model that we used for our SysEQTL. In, uh, in this case, we decided not to use all the SNPs genome-wide. We included, we used a more hypothesis-driven approach. And so we included only eSNPs that we detected from our SysEQTL analysis and any lead variant from our EBIG -WAS, from the EBIG -WAS catalog. And so that's around 70,000 SNPs that we tested in the scan. And so we identified many different associations, as you can see, for uh, different module eigengenes. You'll notice that the numbers here are much bigger for the modules. That's because these are some of our small, smaller modules. And I've looked into the genes that are in these modules, and I've labeled some that I found quite interesting in the septic response. Um, I'll just briefly walk through an example here. So this is still relatively new data, so I'm still working through it. But for example, this IL-9 regulation module is a cis-EQTL for a anti-sense RNA for 
the IL-9 receptor. And the module contains the IL-9 and T-sense RNA and also the IL-9 receptor. Just as an example of the type of regulatory uh, codes that we can decode from this type of analysis. Right. So moving on from here, that was kind of part two. This is, now I'll start talking about the co-localization that I've been doing. So we noted that we had multiple signals present in our CCQTL. So 40% of our CCQTL had more than one uh, signal. And here I'm showing an example of what that looks like. So this is the association plot in the two megabase region uh, near HIF1 alpha. And so when we used our forward regression approach, we identified two signals. And so what, what you can do is condition on one of the uh, signals to get the conditional summary statistics for the other and vice versa. So we did that to account for all the signals that we had. Um, and we use that to perform co-localization in three different ways. So firstly, what we noticed is that, oh, I should mention that we use the coloc package for doing this. And so uh, the first thing that we noticed is that we had around 1,000 eSNPs that were actually tagging multiple eGenes. And so we were curious if those would actually co-localize using our, our method. And so we actually found a surprising number of Suzuki TL that co-localize with each other. So we've, we have evidence for around 780. Uh, well, 781 exactly, that co-localize with each other. And I'll show an example of this in, in the next few slides. We also found evidence of CISPQTL co-localizing with their cognate CISPQTL for, in 14 cases. And then we also found that of the five trans, uh, sorry, of the six trans-PQTL that we had, we found that two pairs co-localized with each other, which we thought was quite surprising. Right, so let me walk through some of the examples here. So I'll start with the CCQTL, as I mentioned. So these are components of the TCR beta chain. So the TCR stands for the T cell receptor, and it is a region of the genome that goes through somatic recombination uh, in the immune system. So your T cells literally, literally recombine uh, their genomic segments to develop these receptors. Um, and we found that the lead eSNP for all these components was the same. Um, in all cases, and so we tested it for pairwise co-localization and found that these regions co-localize with each other. Just as, a, as an example of what this co-localizing CCQTL look like. The two trans-PQTL pairs that I mentioned were also quite interesting, so I'll walk through those uh, in more detail. So I'll start by describing Serpent A1, which I know was mentioned yesterday, so I'll just extend the discussion here. Um, Serpent A1 is a serine protease inhibitor and so it inhibits serine proteases. Serine proteases are released into the bloodstream during the immune response to make way for the immune system to do its work. And so serine protease inhibitors like serpent A1 are key for tamping down the immune response, something that is dysregulated in sepsis, for example. And so serpent A1 has a cis PQTL in our data, as I've shown on the left here. And this is also where three of our trans PQTL uh, lie in the same exact region. And so we were naturally curious if they co-localize. So the, uh, this trans-PQTL for complement factor B and serotransferrin do actually co-localize with the serpent A1 cis-PQTL. But this uh, trans-PQTL for proteoglycan 4 does not co-localize with uh, any of the PQTL I've shown here. And to add some further evidence, the lead variants for the top three PQTL are in an intronic region, while the lead variant for the proteoglycan 4 trans-PQTL is in a coding region. So we also had expression of serpent A1 in whole blood leukocytes. So we were naturally curious to see if we saw any co-localization with cis -PQTL. So there were four signals for cis -PQTL in this region, uh, none of which co-localized with any of the PQTL. This is uh, not particularly surprising because serpent A1 is released by the liver. And we're not sure what the degradation process for serpent A1 is. But in this case, based, based on this, um, we hypothesize that the genetic control of serpent A1 abundance is not in whole blood, which, which does make sense in the immune response. Right, and the final example I'll walk through is uh, for haptoglobin. So haptoglobin also has a cis PQTL in our data set, as I've shown here. And the other pair of trans PQTL that co-localized are also in this region for clusterin and ITIH1. In this case, you can 
kind of visually see, and we confirmed with Coloc that these do not actually colocalize. And we tested for colocalization with any other CCKTL or CISPKTL in this region, and nothing colocalizes with this trans-PKTL signal. On the other hand, we do have CIS-EQTL for haptoglobin as well in whole blood. And there are two signals, a primary and a secondary, and our haptoglobin uh, CIS-PKTL colocalizes with the primary CIS-EQTL in this case. Excellent. So I'll conclude by saying that uh, I've hopefully shown you that there are neutrophil accessibility profiles under specific stimulations that are enriched for CIS-EQTL in our cohort that the module QTL that we have developed will hopefully help us identify some trans regulators of interest. So we're hoping to identify factors that are under cis regulation that might be trans regulators of modules. And finally, that colocalization can help us understand some of the mechanisms that might underlie septic response. Some future steps for me are to use other tools for colocalization. So here we've used coloc, um, but we, we know that we're sharing a significant number of samples between our uh, EQTL and our PQTL. And so we might have to jointly um, model those, those patients. And so there are tools like HyperColoc, for example, that provide a joint model for shared samples. And then finally, I'm also interested in using Bayesian fine mapping tools. So um, things like FindMap and SUSE to extend these results. I'd like to end by thanking the Welcome Sanger Institute, uh, my supervisor, Emma Davenport, of course, and everyone in the Davenport team. Uh, members of the Target Discovery Institute, Welcome Center for Human Genetics, John Radcliffe Hospital, Barts in London, Gaines Investigators, uh, Nurses, and of course the patients. Please contact me. Thank you. So we've got time for a couple of questions. I'll, I'll start then. I, um, I didn't quite catch it. So you had repeated measures for the, for the proteomics and the transcriptomics. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I, I kind of missed what how, how you modeled that. Were mm -hmm. you trying to capture trajectories when uh, defining the cis EQTLs, or was it just kind of repeat? Yes, I, I don't know that we can capture trajectories per se, right? but um, uh, it's yes, we use, we use the patients as a, as a, we assign a random effect to the patient, right? So um, I guess that is how it's modeled in a hierarchical book. So, yeah. but, but it's just kind of like, repeated measure so it kind of shores up yes yeah you're not trying to yeah look at change from day one to no day. no not yet that's 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 some somebody else in the lab is tackling it i see okay thank you oh, was... so i'm interested in the chromatin state data and you, you focused on a taxi here have you looked at dna's as well does that give you any more data sources to pull up? So that, that was the first bit. And then you may have said this, but I missed it. Um, do you have a tax seek in um, everyone? And if so, have you thought about looking at um, sort of, I don't, don't know what people call them, but chromatin QTL, so essentially, mm. might be quite interesting. Yes, uh, so to answer the first question, no, we've not looked at DNA's um, hypersensitivity sites. But that is something we can look into. What I'm extending first is identifying cell type specific peaks rather than just focusing on differentially accessible peaks. And then we're also interested in including more epigenetic marks. So uh, regions of enhancer, like enhancers, promoters have distinct histone signatures. So we're hopefully going to extend into that. Um, your second question. So the accessibility data actually comes from a separate cohort. So your tax seek is prohibitively expensive. And it's, uh, it's, so the sample sizes for that atlas are actually very small. It's like four to six. Uh, patients per, uh, they shouldn't be called patients, they're healthy donors uh, per, per sample. Um, and so no, we, we can't call chromatin accessibility QTL because we don't have genotyping data. Okay, that's a shame. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much yes, again. Thank you. Over to Alan O'Callaghan. Oh. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, optimizing EQTL discovery with base QTL using a, a screening approach that we've come up with. And this is work that's done in the uh, MRCBSU uh, with uh, 
And Chris Wallace is grouped for a little bit by Elena Vigorito. So to, uh, ah, pointing in the wrong direction. Um, to uh, give some background on the problems we're trying to solve. Um, so identifying EQTLs, that is uh, genetic lo loci that are associated with a difference of different levels of uh, gene expression can help us to unravel the mechanisms of genetic associations with disease. But this generally requires matched genotypes and expression data for relatively large populations. Um, but there's a lot of RNA-seq data out there um, that exists without accompanying genotypes, and particularly in disease studies looking at uh, particular cell types or tissues. And we would like to be able to use this type of RNA-seq data, especially from these cell type specific disease studies, to identify the mechanisms of genes variants, the disease variants, and hopefully to unravel kind of a molecular etiology. Um, so the model that I'm going to be talking about, base QTL, is a method for uh, for identifying uh, these EQTLs, and it combines a uh, between individual component that's shown on the left, where we expect a kind of dose response relationship with a genotype, but also a within individual component where we expect um, more reads to map the haplotype that's associated with the uh, QTL. Right. And these are both uh, used to estimate this uh, uh, beta AFC here, which is the uh, allelic full change. So uh, more formally, uh, for the across individual component, we're modeling uh, the counts for a certain gene for individual I given some genotypes and some covariates that'll include things like, you know, the overall uh, library size and other uh, sources of heterogeneity in the RNA-seq data. We're modeling that as a negative binomial with this uh, individual specific mean mu i. And this mu i is, again, just a combination of these uh, uh, allelic log full change uh, according to the genetics and uh, these covariates. Uh, and then we're also, uh, sorry, for the, uh, with an individual component, uh, we're modeling it as a beta, beta binomial distribution where, again, we expect a greater proportion of reads to map to the uh, haplotype that's associated with the QTL. Um, so why would you want to use this approach? Well, the Bayesian approach and the prior spe specification we've used is uh, pretty powerful when you have many not null and a few non null associations, especially in uh, small data sets. Um, and Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, which is the inference engine that we use, provides relatively robust and reliable inference, um, especially compared to uh, things like Metropolis Hastings, which I've spent many days pulling my hair out trying to get right. Um, and the specification in a probabilistic programming language, uh, so it's cut off at the bottom here we're using STAN, allows us to rapidly adapt the model to new data structures and ask new questions of existing data. Uh, so this is really, really uh, useful. But why would you maybe not want to use uh, this approach? Well, Bayesian inference, I've just talked it up, with Hamiltonian Mike Carroll is great and it's robust, but it's also uh, pretty slow. Um, and uh, also for big data with genotypes, this kind of computationally intensive approach may not be feasible or even necessary. If you have tons and tons of power, it's probably not that necessary. Uh, and uh, generally, uh, as it stands, it's not really feasible to do kind of genome-wide uh, study, this type of approach, and just because of how computationally intensive it is. Um, but the advantage of uh, programming languages like STAN is they're always adding uh, new features to it and extending it in different ways. And so one thing that was added a couple of years ago was some approximate inference. Uh, 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 in this case, automatic differentiation variational inference. This is type of black box variational inference. We would like to apply this to our model to make inference more scalable, to identify more associations and to use more complex models. But uh, this uh, approach isn't necessarily that well characterized outside of uh, kind of relatively simple benchmarking studies. Uh, people like to use it on like logistic regression and say, well, therefore it works in general. Yeah, okay, uh, and uh, the quality control of variational inference is maybe less straightforward at times than uh, MCMC. So um, we decided to apply this to eighty-six uh, Givetis lymphoblastic cell line samples, where we have genotypes and seeks. So this is kind of a, uh, a nice test case for uh, for this approach. Um, we're looking at one hundred uh, about fifty thousand associations that we're testing in total. And in the first pass, we just tried to apply Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, and this variational inference method, this black box variational inference method, and just to identify significant associations based on whether or not they're a 99% credible interval crosses the null. Uh, and so if I show a plot of this, uh, you can see that 
there was an attempt made, um, at least. There's some level of a diagonal going on. But um, the estimates seem to be really, really noisy. So here we're looking at the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo estimate on the x-axis and the variational inference estimate on the y-axis. Uh, and so the uh, light red points are points that are uh, non-significant at both. The light blue points are non sig or rather are called as significant using both methods. And if I skip to the next slide, I'll show without the uh, concordant points. So here we're just showing uh, discrepant calls. Uh, we identified that um, there's very few uh, red points here, which are points that we uh, 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 that we're calling as significant using Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, but we're not catching them badly. So we kind of identified that, okay, maybe this uh, approach isn't accurate overall, but maybe it can be useful as a kind of screening approach. Um, so, uh, and yes, it's worth noting that the uh, computational time for uh, ADV on the y-axis here is generally lower than the time it takes for the, the equivalent model to run using Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, which is reassuring. But you would hope so for, for an approximate inference method. Um, so yes, if we can't trust the estimates for ADV outright, can we maybe use it as a screening approach? So uh, to this end, I decided to compare three approaches. The first will be to just identify associations using Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, as we usually do. Uh, the second will be to identify putative hits using the same model uh, using ADV, and then to rerun these uh, putative hits with Hamiltonian Monte Carlo to get a better estimate and a better idea of the posterior uncertainty. And the third approach is just uh, uses a kind of a baseline uh, measure just to see if we can outperform the simplest possible approach is to you identify putative hits just using a generalized uh, linear model uh, of the sort of counts against the genetics and then to rerun these putative hits with uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. And so the decision rule that we use in the model, as I mentioned earlier, is to see whether the uh, credible interval overlaps the null, here's zero. So we can kind of vary the width of this interval from a, uh, excuse me, from a narrow uh, interval, which would be like a more lenient threshold to a wider interval, which would be a more stringent uh, threshold. We can use this to get a probability that the association between the uh, expression level and the SNP is uh, null or non-null. And the uh, linear models we're using are just simple linear models. They're basically similar to the uh, uh, negative binomial regression formula that I showed earlier, but here we're just using a normal or a Poisson like here. And we'll, I'll be referring to these in some figures as LM and GLM, respectively. Um, and so if we consider these uh, as kind of classifiers, uh, where, again, we're, we're trying to identify the uh, true associations that we've identified using Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Um, you can see that the uh, overall performance of uh, the classifiers is relatively good, um, but uh, Adby's clearly uh, by far and away the best. But this isn't necessarily the full story um, because we, what we're really interested in is not a kind of classifier performance, but whether we're actually gaining any time by doing adding this extra step into our inference, right? By, by first running the model so that we can then run the model again, right? Um, so if we consider uh, total time that it takes to run all of our associations with Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, which is the dashed line at the top, um, and then plot the uh, total time that's taken you know, combined with our screening approach and uh, rerunning these putative hits after the fact and plot that against sensitivity, you can see that we can get 100% sensitivity. So we can identify all of our uh, associations uh, with a sort of total reduction in the time taken to uh, perform the whole process of about 80% um, uh, using ad which is great, very great. Uh, oh, in fact, I lied. I, I calculated and that's apparently about 90% rather than 80. Um, but there's some downsides. So the estimates that we get from ADVI can't really be trusted alone and they must be followed up using Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. In some cases, the results are way off, you know, like uh, allelic fold changes or log fold changes of like five, which is just totally unbelievable. Uh, and this is also the easy case where we have known genotypes uh, but how does it do with more complex model? Uh, so just to recap, the, we, the, this model is kind of a, a combination of this negative binomial component between individuals and uh, the beta binomial component within individuals. Uh, and in this case, uh, in the case I showed earlier rather, the genotypes and the haplotypes are, are known a priori from like high quality genotyping data. Um, but uh, in the absence of these high quality genotyping data, we can also use uh, 
model using gene types and haplotypes, haplotypes that are identified from uh, RNA-seq data. But here we want to incorporate the uncertainty on the calls. Um, and so here we're using a mixture of negative binomials uh, across the different possible genotypes that we have in the sample. And similarly for the uh, uh, beta binomial component, we're including a mixture across the possible beta binomial. Again, to be able to infer infer this allelic fold change in the presence of this uncertainty around the genotype and haplotype calls. Um, so uh, the data that I'm using in this case is 92 psoriasis and 82 normal skin samples. In this case, we've got RNA-seq data only and genotypes and haplotypes called from the RNA-seq. And in this case, I'm only looking at about 12,000 tests. And uh, I've abandoned, due to uncertainty of the genotype calls, the linear model and the generalized linear model approaches, although they performed worse than ADV in general anyway, so it's probably not that important. Uh, so now here I'm just comparing the process of identifying associations with Hamilton and Monte Carlo, or this again, this two-stage process where I'm first screening with ADV and then uh, running the putative hits with Hamilton and Monte Carlo. And uh, if I show a similar plot that I showed before, again here with the uh, estimate of the allelic fold change on the x-axis from Hamilton and Monte Carlo, and on the y-axis the same estimate from ADV. Uh, you can see that, again, there's a general smudge along the uh, diagonal, but it's maybe not totally great. Uh, it's also worth noting that this plot has a number of outliers removed, so that, again, the uh, estimates are way somewhere in the basement, uh, effectively. <clears throat> and you can see here that the performance is like substantially worse, uh, possibly from the fact that it's like a more complex high-dimensional model. Uh, it seems to struggle a bit more. Um, and again, if I remove these uh, concordant points and just show the discordant points, it's maybe easier to see. Uh, but there's quite a few more of these uh, uh, red point, dark red points that we're missing uh, if we use the same uh, evidence threshold for variational inferences for Hamilton and Monte Carlo. Um, and in this case, again, the uh, time taken uh, between the two, uh, with ADV on the y-axis and uh, Hamilton and Monte Carlo on the x-axis, is uh, it's slightly less advantageous again, so it's pretty close to di the diagonal actually in this case. And for quite a few, it actually takes longer to run this approximate inference method. And again, if we consider it a classifier, then our performance is relatively good, but this isn't really telling the whole story because there's a, we had a time component. We're not just interested in identifying all of our associations, but we actually want to save time. Uh, and again, if I plot the, uh, our sensitivity, so the amount of associations that we're actually picking up on the x-axis and the total time on the y-axis, and I show the uh, total time that it takes if we just ignore the screening approach entirely and just use Hamiltonian Monte Carlo as a dashed line. Uh, here we can only achieve about a 20% decrease in our total computational time while retaining 100% sensitivity. And even if we uh, accept like, okay, maybe we can afford to miss some of these associations, we don't actually gain that much time in the end, maybe down an extra five or 10%. Uh, so a little bit more discouraging. Uh, so to sum up, <clears throat> ADV provides a somewhat fast and somewhat accurate approximation some of the time. Uh, if anybody uh, happens to uh, use it in a paper without showing that it uh, 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 actually performs well compared to like uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo or uh, some MCMC method for their paper, uh, I would be dubious. I've seen that a couple of times and it's uh, concerning. Uh, the error that we see seems to be kind of stochastic, which is like a little bit unexpected for a variational inference method. We expect the mean estimation to be pretty good, maybe the posterior variance to be off. Um, and with the quote unquote wrong inference settings, you can actually get this approximate method to be substantially slower than Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Uh, but with the good settings that I've used here, it's faster a little bit, uh, but a little, but actually quite inaccurate and again, quite stochastic. Um, but despite all these things, uh, this type of screening approach can make broader screens with the model a little bit more feasible and uh, hopefully useful for sort of. Um, <clears throat> extensions of the model for more complex models in future. Uh, so I think that's me. I'd just like to thank uh, people I've worked with in the Wallace Group for uh, variously guidance, feedback, and encouragement. Uh, the stand development team, who are really excellent at uh, number one, developing statistical tools, and number two, for like, their educational resources. Uh, the organizers for inviting me to speak, and of course, you for your attention. Uh, any questions?
I'll, I'll st so I'm qu quite a naive question. Okay. Um, uh, so when you have certain genotypes in the first part mm -hmm. versus the uncertain genotypes, would the posterior be likely unimodal with certain genotypes and multimodal? And so the, the mixtures that we're using are not, um, we're not inferring the probabilities, so it's less likely to be uh, un uh, multimodal maybe, okay. but uh, possibly it is still, possibly it is getting stuck in local modes. Cause that, or it could be as well that, so it's trying to do some uh, stochastic gradient descent. It could be that the gradients are, are, are much less well-defined or much shallower, just making it difficult. So that could be an issue. Question from John. Hi, uh, um, I'm just, I was interested in the two stage approach. I was just wondering, did you think of doing something like really noddy as a first stage, like, I don't know, T-tests or something, and then running the Hamiltonian MCMC? That was the idea behind the, the linear model, basically. Is like, can we just use the genotypes and it's just a really super fat first pass? Yeah, oh, okay, yeah, and then you had to draw. Like, the, the, the reason yeah. it's a linear model yeah. with the uh, covariates is like, if you don't model library size, then you're just going to get, like, it's not going to do it. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. Okay, let's uh, thank you again, Alan. Over to our next speaker, Ralph Tambets. So, good afternoon, dear audience. My name is Ralph Tambets, and I'm a first year PhD student in bioinformatics at the University of Tartu in Estonia. During this presentation, I'm going to try to give a brief summary about what co localization is, about some of the tools it can be assessed with about why a research group believes considering the central dogma to be help, helpful in co-localization research and about the results we have obtained thus far. The purpose of co-localization analysis is finding out whether two different traits are caused or affected by the same variants in a single genetic region. It is a fundamental approach for identifying candidate genes that causally mediate complex trait associations. In order to obtain meaningful results, co-localization analysis should be carried out on fine map data. So they are usually preceded by two common steps, uh, genome-wide association studies to find the correlating locus and fine mapping to find the causal variants. After that, everything is set and we're ready to look for co-localizations. Several co-localization methods have been described over the years our research group decided to focus on three of them. They are e caviars co-localization posterior probability, which I will refer to as CLPP, that was first introduced in 2016, and two versions of Coloc, Coloc ABF, or Coloc version 3, and Coloc SUSI, or Coloc version 5, which were chiefly developed by our host, Chris Wallace, and published in 2014 and 2021, respectively. The main difference between CLPP and COLOC is that CLPP operates at the variant level while COLOC works at the locus level. To search for co-localizations, CLPP only focuses on the variants that are shared between fine mapped credible sets in the two loci, while COLOC takes a broader approach. The difference between the two versions of COLOC is that version 3 makes the simplifying assumption that only a single causal variant can exist in any given locus. Version 5, the latest version, has foregone the simplification and can detect, for example, up to 10 signals of different strength per locus. This means that theoretically comparing two loci can entail comparing up to 100 different pairs of signals. If we look under the bonnet, both versions of COLOC assign probabilities to five different hypotheses, 
with hypothesis four being the one that claims that the traits share causal variants, aka they co-localize. Analyzing the effectiveness of co-localization methods isn't necessarily easy. One of the main challenges of benchmarking them is a lack of ground truth about causal associations in re real data. That is, we don't know which variants actually cause which traits. Usually, similar issues are solved by creating synthetic data sets. However, this raises additional questions, as it is hard to tell how well a synthetic data set portrays the real world. This is the reason we decided to compare CIS-CQTL and CIS-PQTL data. We feel that due to the central dogma, it is natural to presume that the most likely causal gene for each CIS-PQTL is the gene coding for the protein. Essentially, we're claiming that Essentially, we're claiming that the cis CQTL that influences the protein coding genes mRNA production also influences the production of the protein and so co localizes with the cis PQTL. That assumption allows us to use real data and to consider a signal between said cis PQTL and said cis CQTL as a true positive. In our research, we got our EQTL data from the 31 studies that make up the EQTL catalog. In total, we used 103 tissue-specific data sets that cover most of the human body. We used the interval study as our PQTL data source. It contains about 3,600 plasma proteins from about 3,300 participants. To gauge the effectiveness of the methods, we ran co-localization analysis between each EQTL study and the interval study and determined how many of the genes in any of the EQ <clears throat> how many of the 851 cis PQTLs in the interval study were found to co-localize with any of the genes in any of the EQTL studies. In accordance with the literature, we set the significance threshold of 0 0.8 for both versions of coloc and a threshold of 0 0.1 for CLPP. The results obtained can be seen on the screen now as an offset graph. The different columns on the offset graph indicate the intersections of the sets of results of each method. In total, in the 103 data sets, the expression of 624 of the 851 proteins were found to be a co-localizing trait at least once. As we can see, 212 of the proteins were found to co-localize by all three methods. The method with the biggest yield was coloc version five with nearly 600 different proteins, while version three found 428 and CLPP found 277. It is also worth noting that only 11 signals that CLPP found at those thres thresholds were not found by Colac version 5. We can also see that version 5 found 185 signals that version 3 did not. That can be explained by what was already mentioned. Version 3 isn't set up to de detect signals from multiple causal variants. This could do with an example. So the slide you're seeing now is a locus that ver version three failed to find the signal in. The protein under review is BPI, AKA bactericidal permeability increasing protein, which is found chiefly in neutrophils with its main function being killing gram negative microbes in the body. It is coded by the BPI gene in chromosome 20. The graph describes the rela relationships between the BPI protein and the BPI gene that codes for it. So in this study, we consider this signal to be a true positive. P-values assigned to the PQTL variants are shown on the x-axis and P-values assigned to the EQTL variant on the y-axis. We can see that a couple of groups of variants are clustered together on the graph, but according to version three, the probability of co-localization is tiny, 10 to the power of negative six. Version five, however, is able to distinguish between the two groups and finds two separate signals that are both highly correlated with the causal gene of BPI. The probability of co-localization is high in both cases, 99% and 92%. Similar examples are pretty common in cases where version five found the, strong, found the signal strong enough to clear the threshold and version three did not the probability of co-localization that version three assigned to the signal was near zero in the ma majority of cases. In contrast, in cases where version three found the signal and version five did not, version five often came up with, with values that were just under the threshold. <clears throat>
This shows that by lowering the cutoff threshold, version 5 would likely find an even bigger proportion of the results that version 3 obtained. Before powering forward, I'm going to take a minute to go over what we mean by the terms recall and precision. Recall is calculated by dividing the number of true positive signals by the sum of true positives and false negatives. In our case, the more proteins that were found to co-localize with the corresponding causal gene, the bigger the recall. Precision is the proportion of the detected positive signals that are true positives. It is also known as positive predictive value. That is, the fewer false negative values we get, the better the precision. When analyzing the recall of the methods, we can see that no matter the cutoff we pick as a co-localization probability threshold, coloc V5 finds more true signals than coloc version 3. In this and the following graphs, the cutoffs on the x-axis show how likely a co-localization has to be to be taken into account. For example, if we only look at signals with a posterior probability of co-localization, at least 80%, coloc 5 detects 52% of all true, all true signals. As for precision, coloc version 3 almost always has about a 10% higher value. At the default cutoff, the values are about 40% and 30% respectively. Upon adding CLPP to the graphs, we can see that due to it only focusing on variants that are shared between credible sets, the precision at its recommended cutoff of 0 0.1 is considerably better than for either version of coloc. However, at 24%, the recall is only half of what coloc version 5 could manage. What we tried next was to improve on the results. We noticed that when for each protein, we only kept, kept the result with the highest co-localization probability, we experienced a slight loss in recall because we lost a few true positive signals. However, we also got rid of a high percentage of false positives, so the rise in precision was pretty noteworthy. For example, coloc version 5's recall dropped from 52% to 42%, but its precision, precision spiked from 32% to 61%, boosting it past version 3. CLPP's accuracy rose to a whopping 73%. In comparison, the closest gene approach showed a recall of 30% and a precision of 46%. However, when we narrowed the genes under review by only keeping protein coding genes, the results shown were by far the best. Uh, of course, it should be noted that by doing so, we no longer have a level footing between the closest gene approach and the co-localization methods, as we used more than just protein coding genes when running the analysis. So our pipeline should be given another spin before completely disregarding all co-localization methods. A downside to the closest gene approach that we hope can be mitigated by using co-localization is the fact that the closest gene approach ignores context and declares that the same causal signal is seen in every tissue. This is not the case for tissue-specific co-localization. A possible future direction that we might look into is analyzing the way the signals pair up with each other. The table on the slide shows which PQTL signal was deemed to co-localize with which EQTL signal in every tissue that they were said to co-localize in. We can see that, for example, in testicular tissue, only the fifth, strong, fifth strongest PQTL signal was claimed to co-localize with the second strongest signal of the EQTL. The lack of stronger pairs makes this pairing seem suspicious. An interesting observation was that, according to domain knowledge, the likeliest cells to find the BPI protein in are neutrophils, and they happen to be the only cells in which the two strongest signals of the PQTL lined up with the two strongest signals of the EQTL in. Right now, mind you, this is the only such table that we have generated, so it is too early to make any grand statements. I'd like to leave you with a couple of take home messages. They are that version 5 showed better recall but worse precision than version 3 by default. That CLPP's re recall was lowest but its precision was highest. That using only the highest probability result raised precision for all methods. And that version 5's precision caught up with version 3's precision because of it. That in cases where version 3 found the co localization and version 5 did not, version 5 result was often just under the threshold, so tinkering with that can be helpful.
that the closest gene baseline approach proved tough to beat and that additional calculations should be made to properly compare them and that possibly co-localization, unlike the closest gene approach, can reveal context. Finally, I'd like to thank my co-author Anastasia Golde and my supervisor Kaur Alaso and also extend my thanks to my university's High Performance Computing Center for computational resources and the Estonia Re Research Council for funding. And thank you for your time and attention. Hi. Um, there's plenty of examples in biology where protein levels are not determined by mRNA abundance. Um, now, it's not particularly common, but it is there. Do you have any, any idea or any feel for how common that might be amongst the proteins you're looking at, particularly since you're looking at plasma protein levels and, and as you're saying, it could relate to expression in a whole bunch of different tissues be dominated by one. Do you have any idea well, what the level of, what to what extent your central dogma assumption mm -hmm. actually holds across the full range of proteins? Unfortunately, right now I don't, it wouldn't even be an educated guess, it would just be a guess, so I'll refrain from it. Thanks. Uh, it's a really cool idea. Um, it, my question is really an extension of the previous one. So the, the cases where the more sophisticated co-localization method does less well than the, the more basic methods, um, do you, have you seen um, like less correlation between protein levels and expression levels at those, at those low side? That, that, those might be indications that this is, you know, the sophisticated method might actually be correct in that there is, there is less evidence for co-localization co in that case. That's something we need to take a look into. I can't answer that right now, sorry. Sure. So we have a question on Zoom from Neem. Neem, would you like to unmute yourself and say your question? Hi, yes, thank you. Um, I was wondering if you'd considered modeling um, the closest gene approach, but only looking at the proteins expressed in the appropriate tissues. That last figure you showed of the different tissues um, was quite interesting. And I just wondered how that would affect the precision and recall. Could you repeat that? So only modeling using the closest gene approach, yep. but, but subsetting the, the proteins to those that were expressed in your tissues of interest. I, again, I have to thank you for the suggestion, but we didn't, didn't yet check that. Okay. Oh, just got another question in the room. Uh, I thank you for the really great talk. I think it's really great that we're trying to find some truth in biology by just testing the central dogma. It's really, really cool. Um, just tying into the question about the protein levels, have you considered looking at uh, presence or absence QTLs to really test this? Because if you have absence of expression, you're also supposed to have absence of protein. So instead of looking at a quantification of your QTL, you could have, you could look at like a presence or an absence to really, um, well, if there's no expression, there's no protein. So that's, that's really grand truth, I guess, mm -hmm. you're going for. That's uh, maybe a suggestion, maybe a question, if you've thought about it. Uh, actually, I told you pretty much everything that we have all tested so far, so <laughs> all of those might stay in the future for now. Thanks. Just thank you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is virtual. Okay, uh, hello. I will share my screen in a minute. And um, uh, can you confirm that you uh, can see everything? Yes, we can. 
Okay, that's wonderful. Uh, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Kaido uh, and I am presenting from the University of Lausanne. So a few days ago, I still thought that I would be present in Cambridge to present, but uh, I couldn't make it in the end. Uh, so I'm very happy that this conference is held in hybrid format and I'm still able to talk to you about my work on mediation analysis. Uh, to get started, consider an exposure X and an outcome Y, and let's assume that we have identified that there is a causal uh, effect between them. So we mark it with the directed edge here. Uh, the existence of the causal effect tells us that there is a causal pathway from X to Y, but it does not convey any additional information uh, about this pathway. So figuratively speaking, there is a big box of uh, unknown in the middle. Um, so mediation in an analysis is all about eliminating some of this unknown and decomposing the total causal effect into a direct and an indirect effect. So here I have introduced K mediators, M1 to MK, and we call the effects from X to Y that go through these mediators, uh, the indirect effects, and they can be estimated as the product of uh, commas and deltas. And the total indirect effect is the sum of these. And the direct effect represents the causal pathway that does not go through the mediators and is represented by uh, alpha. And the distinction uh, of direct and indirect causal effects makes it possible to ask interesting questions about the human biology. And this is something that uh, our group in Lausanne has recently been interested uh, doing, and specifically in the context of determining the role of uh, omics mediation uh, between uh, different traits. And those of you who visit, uh, who are in Cambridge uh, had a chance to visit the poster session and possibly talk to a colleague of mine, Maurice Sadler, uh, and already get a glimpse into some of the work that we have been doing in here. And specifically, Marie looked at, uh, uh, like studied the causal effects from DNA methylation and to disease and, and in, in what extent do they do these causal effects cascade through gene expression and, and, and protein abundance? And this is a, this is a paper, uh, I mean, there is a paper about this study that was recently published on Bioarchives. So those who did not get the chance to talk to Marie, I encourage you to look it up and, 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 and read. Uh, but the problem that I have been uh, trying to solve is, uh, is somewhat similar, but, uh, but a little bit different as well. So we are trying to, uh, kind of find which omics layers detectably mediate uh, causal effects between cardiometabolic risk factors to disease. But while tackling this question, and this is also something that Marie notes in her paper, is that the methodology to robustly perform mediation analysis in large scale with potentially hundreds or even thousands of mediators is somewhat lacking. Uh, so in the following presentation, I will introduce you to how we started off with the analysis what are the caveats of existing methodology and, and, and what we propose to improve on it. So when I say robustly performing mediation analysis, I mean doing it in a Mendelian randomization framework that is resistant to confounding from unmeasured variables. And it can be done in, in three steps. So the first step, we would perform a univariable MR testing for the total causal effect of the exposure to the outcome. And this is the standard a directed acyclic graph of a of a Mendelian randomization analysis with in, uh, with instruments G1 to GS, and this kind of graph you have seen many times already. So I won't uh, discuss the assumption and anything. The second step we would perform a multivariable MR by considering all of the mediators together with the exposure as risk factors in the model together, and estimating the direct effects from the exposure and from the mediators. And, uh, and here I would like to note that we are making a distinction between the instruments to the exposure, the Gs, and the instruments to the mediators, the Fs, even though in, in multivariable MR this distinction is not necessarily uh, required. And the, for, uh, the third step would be using this direct causal effect and the total causal effect to find uh, what is the proportion of the causal effect between X and Y that goes through the mediators or equivalently what is the direct effect proportion. And one way to do that is to simplify the ratio of the direct and total causal effect. Or if we have many exposure outcome pairs that we have analyzed, we can also 
put them into a scatter plot and, uh, and, and run a regression analysis on these points here and take the, uh, the slope of the regression line as the, as the direct effect proportion. Uh, however, while this sounds all good in theory, uh, we encountered a, a rather large problem in our analysis where the exposure sample size was considerably bigger than the mediator sample size. And this is typically the case when, uh, when studying how different omics uh, layers uh, mediate causal effects between complex traits, because omics data such as transcriptomics or proteomics or, or, met, met, or uh, even uh, metabolomics, um, uh, they, they usually are measured in much smaller samples where the sample sizes might range in thousands or tens of thousands. While the, while the complex traits are measured in, in bigger samples like the UK Biobank that have sample sizes in the range of 300,000. And this figure here uh, depicts the relationship of mediator sample size on the x-axis and the direct effect proportion on the y-axis in a simulation study. And the yellow uh, line here uh, gives the direct effect proportion estimate of the MR framework in a, in, in, in a situation where the exposure sample size is fixed to 300,000, there are 500 mediators of which 5% are non-zero and the true direct effect proportion is 0.85. And the difference from, from this yellow line to the black horizontal line gives the bias of our, uh, of our, our MR uh, framework we're estimating the, uh, the need mediation. And as we can see, this bias can be very substantial. So whenever the mediator sample size is in the range of 1,000, we are almost not able to detect any mediation at all because of the bias. And there's an opposite effect when the exposure sample size is smaller than the mediator sample size. So this situation is not likely to come up as often uh, because, uh, because omics data usually have smaller uh, sample sizes. But this figure represents the same simulation study as in the previous slide. But here we have fixed the mediator sample size to 30,000 and varying the exposure sample size on the x-axis. And we can see that we greatly underestimate the direct effect proportion when the exposure sample size is much smaller than the mediator sample size. And to, uh, to get what is going on, um, let's consider the multivariable MR model. Uh, as, as, as many of you know, uh, MR is just a regression analysis. So we can just reorganize the direct day cyclic graph into a regression equation. Uh, the cells in the empty vectors and matrices here uh, correspond to the estimate of the instruments on the outcome, uh, depicted as the small p hat, uh, or to the, to the mediators, depicted as the big p hat, and to the exposure, depicted as the beta hat. Uh, uh, and, and these are the summer statistics that are available to us and that are used to perform an MR analysis. Epsilon is the error, alpha and delta are the parameters or, or the causal effects that we're trying to estimate. And uh, when performing an inverse variance weighted MR analysis to estimate the causal effects, we're essentially minimizing the sum of squares of errors of this regression model. However, uh, as all of you, I'm sure, knows, uh, regression assumes that the exploratory variables are fixed, whereas the summary statistics that we're using as exploratory variables in the MR analysis are estimated with error, and this error is inversely proportional to the sample size of the study that was used to um, estimate the summary statistics. And the smaller the, the sample, the bigger the variance. And this phenomenon is, uh, is referred to as regression dilution bias by the people who work with regression. And it's called uh, weak instrument bias uh, by the people who work with MR. And this bias forces the coefficients in, in the regression model, uh, in this case, the causal effects alpha and uh, delta towards zero. But the forces acting on these, uh, on these parameter estimates are different due to the sample size differences. And that is probably the reason why we experience this large bias in the direct effect uh, proportion. So naturally, we wanted to decrease the bias in our analysis, uh, and we came up with an approach that crucially uses exactly the same uh, data, exactly the same information, but makes a few additional assumptions on top of the MR assumptions and optimizes a slightly different model. And here we can see we just reorganized uh, the model a little bit, we introduce, uh, sorry, I went too far, uh, we in introduce uh, 
basically the commas or the direct effects from the exposure to the mediators that the multivariable MR model uh, was not considering. And this is the main difference, actually. Uh, to estimate the causal effects, alpha, gamma, and delta, uh, we have derived the likelihood function uh, corresponding to this directed acyclic graph here. And uh, to do so, we have relied on the MR assumptions, but also a few additional ones that we believe are quite realistic. So the first assumption is that we assume that the summary statistics are estimated with Gaussian error. We assume that the exposure instruments and mediator instruments are independent. So we can't include genetic variants that instrument both the exposure and any of the mediators. And we assume no sample overlap between the exposure tumors and the mediator uh, studies. And based on these assumptions, we were able to derive likelihood function uh, depicted uh, uh, for, 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 for the director say cyclic graph depicted on, on, the, on the slide here. And I hope you believe me when I say that this, uh, this likelihood was a multivariable caution. And getting estimates for the causal effects uh, requires just maximizing this likelihood. And, and when we do that, and when we run the same simulation study as before, that mimicked uh, omics mediation between complex traits, we see that we are able to decrease the bias uh, this is, uh, 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 but compared to the MR framework. Uh, the likelihood uh, method estimates here are depicted in blue. And, and we can see that the bias is estimated up to 27% in some simulation uh, in, in when, when the mediator sample size is roughly three to 10,000 in the, in the simulation analysis. But the likelihood function is also uh, it, it also has a small problem, and the problem is that for each mediator in the model, there are two parameters to estimate, the causal effect from, from the exposure to the mediator and the causal effect from the mediator to the outcome, which means the number of par parameters to estimate blows up quite fast, and this makes the analysis rather slow when we have uh, 400 mediators in the model. So here we have depicted uh, a graph that shows the runtime of the method in minutes, uh, and its dependence on the number of mediators in the model. And when the, there are 400 mediators, the method takes 25 minutes to run, which we thought is a limitation. So we improved the method further. We realized we don't really need to estimate individual interact effects through the mediators. Uh, if we wanted to just know what is the total uh, mediation effects through all of the mediators uh, together, and, uh, and therefore, we treat the commas and the deltas, the interact effect through the mediators, as random. And instead of maximizing the joint likelihood of all the causal effects, we integrated them out and maximized the marginal likelihood. So the likelihood uh, still remains to be Gaussian. And we also assume the Gaussian prior for the commas and deltas. So we assume the p-variate uh, Gaussian prior. Um, it's, uh, each of these. Um, uh, so basically, the commas and deltas, uh, they can be correlated uh, when it comes to a single mediator, but, uh, but, the, but the indirect effects through the mediators uh, are independent when it comes to different mediators. And, uh, and there is also something else I would like to point out here, is that under this prior, the covariance between the commas and deltas gives us the expected individual uh, mediation effect. And multiplying this with the number of mediators k, we can get the total expected mediation effect that we are interested in. So we don't know, need to know the, the individual estimates uh, for each of these uh, parameters, gamma and delta. We just need to know what is the, uh, what is the covariance between, uh, between these estimates. And then multiply this with, uh, with the number of mediators. And after considerable effort, and seriously, there's been a lot of math involved uh, to simplify this likelihood, uh, we can bring the, the runtime of the method down quite considerably. And this is depicted here in, in, in red. So essentially, while before uh, it took 25 minutes to, to run an analysis which had 400 mediators in the model, we can now run the same analysis in, in just two minutes. Uh, but more importantly, we are also able to reduce the bias further so again, the red line here depicts the new results in the same simulation study that I showed you earlier. And, uh, and we are able to reduce the bias, uh, not only compared to the likelihood method further, 
but we are able to reduce the bias compared to the MR framework by roughly 50%. So we are pretty happy with that. However, uh, the key question is whether the method also works well on real data. And unfortunately, this project is still very much a work in progress and we're just about getting to the analysis part. So I can't answer this question at the moment. Uh, however, should anyone be interested in early insights, uh, don't hesitate to already get in touch. We are also or, uh, preparing ground for further analysis. Uh, for example, we're interested in which tissues mediate causal effects from complex trait to disease. And, uh, and while this is a difficult question to tackle because, the, uh, because uh, for example, considering gene expression in different tissues, the sample size there are quite small. We are, we are still hoping that uh, our method makes it possible to tackle this question. And finally, uh, some take home messages. Uh, First, it's, it's very important to, to, to perform an, an uh, mediation analysis, and not only mediation analysis, but, but causal network analysis that integrate more of the available data, because the human biology, I mean, we, we are a big system, and, and just looking at pairwise uh, associations, it is not going to, in the end, most likely give us as much uh, knowledge about this system than incorporating more information. Uh, second, MR-based mediation is susceptible to huge biases due to regression dilution and weak instruments. Third, we developed likelihood and integrated likelihood-based methods uh, that can reduce this bias in simulations up to 27 and 50%. And finally, our method uses only summer statistics, can be applied as easily as MR, and tolerates hundreds or possibly thousands of mediators simultaneously, and we're developing an R package uh, as we speak. And uh, with that, I would like to end. Uh, I'm thankful for all the people who have been involved with this project. Uh, this includes Kaurav Lashov from the University of Tartu, who pitched in with, uh, with some great ideas. And also, I would like to thank the people in the Statistical Genetics Group in Lausanne. And I would like to thank the organizers for a great conference and for, uh, for giving me this opportunity to talk about my work. And I would like to thank the audience for, uh, for listening. With that, I'm happy to take questions. Do we have any questions in the room? Uh, any online questions? I'll, I'll start with um, uh, uh, very nice talk, by the way. Thank you. Um, so I understood that the approach is trying to account for the um, uh, the smaller sample sizes available for the mediators, um, but I suppose. I suppose intuitively you would need some level of precision around the causal effect estimation of the exposure to, to be able to kind of understand or decompose what it's being mediated by. Is, is that something you've thought about? Almost kind of from the other side, any, is there any way to develop a feel for how, how well you you need to be able to instrument the exposure to be able to start to ask about mediation. Uh, well, well, this is this is yeah, precisely the relationship between the sample size of the mediators and the sample size of the of the exposure that I talked to you about, and I, and I can actually show you another figure here. Is that uh, when the mediator sample size is smaller? It's like here it is like three thousand, and we assume the uh, so, uh, so, uh, sorry the exposure sample size is three thousand here. And the mediator sample size is 30,000, which means the mediator summer statistics have been estimated with much greater precision than the exposure summer statistics. Then the MR framework greatly underestimates the direct effect proportion. So there is this kind of balance uh, between the between uh, like co going on there, uh, and and this is actually crucially to show that our method is able to correct for that kind of bias as well. So for sure you need uh, large enough sample sizes to reduce the weak instrument bias for the exposure as well. Um, but, uh, and, and this is this is something that we are considering and, and this is something that we have been looking and, uh, and, uh, and currently it feels like our method uh, does quite well in that regard. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, so let's thank uh, Kaido again. Thank you very much. And uh, we've
now got a break uh, until half five for coffee is at the back of the room. Half three. Sorry. Yeah. Oh. Thank <laughs> you.